As a black woman and emergency room physician for more than a decade in an overwhelmingly white and male profession, Dr. Michelle Harper is passionate about the persistent societal issues that impact patients and providers alike. In her memoir, The Beauty in Breaking, Harper shares how her own experiences with trauma and resiliency have inspired her career trajectory and how she learned to bring great empathy into all of her emergency room interactions. Her memoir is a national bestseller and was included in the New York Times list of 100 notable books of 2020. For today's conversation, Dr. Harper is joined by Dr. Kendra Holmes, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Afenia Healthcare, where she oversees health center operations and serves as the Director of Pharmacy Operations. Dr. Holmes is a recipient of the St. Louis College of Pharmacy Distinguished African American Alumni Award and the St. Louis American Foundation's Excellence in Healthcare Award. Dr. Kendra Holmes. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Affinia Healthcare. And on behalf of the St. Louis County Library, HEC Media, and Left Bank Books, I am absolutely honored to be speaking with New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Michelle Harper. Welcome, Dr. Michelle Harper. Thank you. It is wonderful to be joining you today. Awesome. So The Beauty and Breaking is Dr. Harper's memoir. It's a fascinating look into the life of emergency medicine and her personal journey towards healing and to becoming a healer. Thank you again for taking time to chat with me today. So I wanna just get right in because I have so many questions for you. So one of the images that really struck me in the book that you described so vividly was of you being a little girl and it was the fish room, I believe. Yeah. And um, you were playing with your My Little Ponies and I was a My Little Pony girl as well. And being visited by your guardian angel and receiving a message from that, your guardian angel. And I wanna know what that message meant to you and how it caused you to become a, a physician. I was around seven years old and the house was quiet and peaceful which was also memorable because it was such an unstable environment. Um, I grew up, as I discussed in the memoir, with uh, an abusive father who was a batterer. And on this day though, it was quiet and I was playing with my little ponies and I received a message. I was, I was alone in the room. My mother was upstairs, no one else was in the house, but I heard a voice. Um, I didn't see anyone, but I heard this voice tell me that I would be safe that my family, and I considered my family, my mother, my brother, my sister, that we would be safe and we would survive. And she went on to say that I also had to because I would go on to help many people. And I remember that I ran upstairs and I didn't quite understand the second part of the message, but I received and understood that we would be okay, which was the first time I had felt comfort and security in that. And it was the only thing I ever wanted to know when I was growing up. And I shared that message with my mother and throughout the years, it stayed with me. And it, it's really what buttressed me throughout my childhood, um, even young adulthood, really. Um, and, and as I got older, of course, then I understood the second part of the message, which has been my mission my entire life. Your life's work, yes, awesome. Awesome. So honestly, I simply could not put this book down, just 100%, I, I could not. And as a black woman working in the healthcare industry, I just, your experiences really just spoke to me. So what encouraged you to write this book? You know, it was that I resonate more with the, the work of being a healer with that title over any other title. So yes, it's important it's important to me, um, I enjoy being a doctor, but that work can be fulfilled in so many different fields. And in the ER, I, you know, when I'm fortunate, I can help one person at a time, perhaps one family, maybe even one community, but with writing, the potential is so much greater. I mean, that transcends 
borders. I mean, that's international work potential. So, so that's why I had to do it. And there were so many stories that stayed with me, um, especially because the, the first seeds were planted, I think, during my residency, okay. loosely. But I, I, there were stories that stayed with me when I started to consider what we do in the ER, but how the work of healing is so much more layered and complicated. So as an ER physician, you're dealing with constant stress. Um, you know, I just was reading the chapters and it was just like you, you barely had a moment to yourself to think. Why emergency medicine? Growing up with abuse, I mean, typically all I had was a snapshot in time. So I, I had to decide in the moment, okay, is, is there imminent danger? Is there, is there some critical action that we need to take so that we live, so that we're not harmed? Or is this likely to blow over, it's not so dangerous, or perhaps there's no danger at all in this moment. And that's all I had in the moment to decide ever since I was young and that, that is the exact skill yeah, set that, that is... I bring to the ER. <laughs> wow, just with your career, I just, reading the book, I just so admire your like, your laser focus with your career and advancement and just, you know, one goal you accomplish, you're on to the next goal. And unfortunately, sometimes that causes relationship issues. Mm -hmm. So you were very honest about the issues with your divorce and, and how that tra transpired. So how did you heal from that situation? That relationship broke down because I was on my path. Mm -hmm. And in his words, he wasn't on his. He felt insecure yeah. um, as a result. And that is, you know, I, I told that story because, you know, unfortunately, I think that's something that many women and especially professional women can relate to. And, um, and I never, I never personally want to feel the need to shrink who I am to make someone else feel comfortable because then I won't accomplish what I am here to do. Also, I will enable dysfunction in the other person. So if I truly love myself, I won't do that. If I truly love the other person, I won't do that. And that may mean walking away or the dissolution of a relationship. And whatever, whatever relationships are nurturing, whatever partnerships are meant to be in that moment, that season or lifetime, as they say, yes. will happen as I live in alignment on my path. And then of course, there are some other tools like yoga I'm a spiritual person, but not religious. And I'm so happy that museums are open again because yes. they, they are my temples, like having community, like just communion with the art, really. Um, those are a, a couple of my main tools. I do have to say that I was amused when I read that um, you all had the discussion and then you said within 48 hours after the discussion, you had found an attorney and you were divorced. And I was like, wow, Dr. Harper doesn't play. She just, <laughs> she just was <laughs> real. No, <laughs> no, the actual divorce took months, but yeah, no, I lined it up because I had things to do. I gotta keep it moving. I mean, it was heartbreaking, yes. heartbreaking, but I also believe that when it's possible, you know, it's not always possible, but when it's possible, when there's that moment of recognition of this is the situation and this is what I need to do, then do it. Right. And then sure, I'll fall apart later. I'll pick up the pieces right. later. So you are one of very few, I'm sure, um, black women who are emergency room physicians. So let's talk about the microaggressions. I, I know, <laughs> yes, the, the microaggressions and, you know, the promotions that you didn't receive because you were a Black woman. I, I know very well about those issues. So how do you deal with that? And whenever I tell um, the story of me being passed over a promotion, there, in events, there are audible gasps. And then, of course, I hear from so many women um, how they have the same story. And it's, it's usually more than one story to that effect where I, um, I was doing clinical work in the ER, but I, but I felt I wanted to have more of an impact. And I thought, well, maybe through doing administrative work within the hospital, that would be even more positive impact that I could make. Um, so a position came up and I interviewed for it. 
Um, I enjoyed the interviews. I thought I did well. I like meeting people, chatting with them. <laughs> so it, it was even fun. And then the day came when I was going to get the decision from my ER director. So I went to his office and I just waited for him to let me know how I got the job. <laughs> and he apologized and he said, I am so sorry because you are so qualified for this job. And in fact, you were the only applicant for the job, but they've decided they're just gonna leave it open and then proceeded to tell me, I hope you stay with us because this hospital never promotes women or people of color. So they always leave, but I hope you stay anyway. And I did uh, submit my letter of resignation. And then because I still live in the area, uh, I was friends with people there at the time. And I heard that the hospital decided not long after I left that it was the perfect time to hire. And they hired someone, they hired a white male nurse for the job. A and, nurse. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. mm. So that's an important for me to amplify the bigotry and structural inequity that happens. Um, and I've had so many people say, I cannot believe he told you they never uh, promote women and people of color. And I will say, yes, he, he was very honest and forthcoming. What's even more concerning is that typically people don't say it. So he said it, so there's no question in my mind, but 9.9 .9 times out of 10, it's not said, it's just done. And that is why, yes, I am one of, depending on the stats, two or two and a half percent of black female physicians in this nation, um, why we have a pay gap when it, uh, when it comes to women, people of color. I mean, the list goes on. And what keeps me going, what gives me hope is doing this work to change it because I do believe change is possible. I do believe that instead of continuing to live in an extractive society, we can have one that's symbiotic mm -hmm. and just. And have you seen some improvement? No, <laughs> no, not yet. Well, I will say that. <laughs> I will say that um, the improvement. Oh, I, I love your honesty. <laughs> Alex. Yeah. I will keep it real for the people. The improvement I've seen is wanting to engage in that dialogue. Some other changes I've seen is that when people um, behave in ways that are more clearly discriminatory, that they're less likely to be rewarded. So for example, if there's a patient who says something racist against a provider, instead of the it, the administrative team just backing them up and saying, couldn't you have handled it differently? They're less likely to do it because there's a little more of an understanding that no, there's larger issues here. So small incremental change. There has to be much more. Right. We just have to keep at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just back a little bit to the microaggressions. So throughout the book, you, you had different, you know, incidents that you dealt with. And I just noticed every time you responded with poise and class and so much grace. And um, sometimes I, I struggle with that when, when the microaggressions occur. So, you know, again, how, how are you in that space when, you know, the resident, the story that you, you said about the resident when she questioned um, your decision related to the, the individual who was just as involved. How do you, you, you actually turned it into a teaching moment, which is a wonderful physician. That's, that's what wonderful physicians do. But how do you, how do you stay in that, in that space? I was an, an attending in the ER, of course. I mean, that's what I do. So I was the attending physician in, in that section, the only attending physician on, so the physician in charge. And she was my resident and I heard some commotion in the triage section. So a, a new patient was being brought in and there was a bit of a ruckus that I heard. So I was trying to finish up my work to get there, but I saw my resident go over and this is a person who I am training. So I, ha I have to give her a chance to see if she can manage it. And then what becomes clear as I hear and look over is that it's um, a young black man who's brought in, he's in police custody um, and the police make the allegation, he swallowed a bags of drugs. We brought him here for you to get them out. This man does not want to be evaluated. He doesn't want to be examined. Um, 
the police, my resident, the rest of the ER staff who are in that area are essentially telling him that he doesn't have a say in it and they want to force an illegal examination and possibly treatment on him. So I go over and intervene. Um, I do an assessment. He's confident, he's sober. He is allowed to make these decisions. Patients, humans have rights in this country. So I make everyone aware of that, including the police, that that would be illegal. And because he wants to be discharged from the ER, that is what I tell him I will do. And I go back to my desk to get the paperwork ready. The resident has called what she feels is a higher force um, she didn't tell me, but she just did. And I hear that hospital ethics is on the phone. So she speaks to hospital ethics and legal who inform her that I am correct and that she cannot override my order. Um, and then she just goes on to see patients and I discharge him. So it was a teachable moment. Um, and it was important for me to remind the police of the law as well as everyone in the department um, and as I discuss in that, the two darkest people there, Dominique, I call the patient, and myself, are black. Uh, everyone else involved uh, is white. And it was tragic and sad that our personal sovereignty, both of us, was considered so provisional. Um, and that's why I had that discussion. And I will say, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope that resident learned from it. Did we, I'm often asked, oh, did we talk more later? Did we become friends? No, we did not we become <laughs> friends. She was always kind of challenging. And I don't know why she didn't consider these issues more deeply. I hope since then she has and taken corrective action. And I will say that the expectation on myself um, and other women and providers of color to always be the champions of these issues and to have so much grace and poise. Mm -hmm. And in the face of such indignity is unfair. And I point out that it is hard and it is exhausting. And sometimes we don't have the follow-up conversation like I didn't have with the resident because I didn't have enough energy to, and I needed to go on and see more patients. And that was part of my self-care. And it's also why I have these discussion because anyone else in the department could have done what I did and they didn't. And that needs to change. Absolutely. There's a lot of distrust, of course, um, in the medical system and uh, with the medical system in mm -hmm. the black community. And we see that a lot with vaccine hesitancy with, with COVID-19. What do we do? How do we start to, you know, dis dismantle that distrust? How do we get the community to be more accepting of, of the medical system? So if the system is trustworthy, then people will trust it. <laughs> so that's, that's absolutely true. Oh, well, we have to. Okay, but of course then that's it, multiple steps involved. Um, you know, there enter diversity, equity, and inclusion, not in a performative way, in a, in a fundamental, um, substantive way. Um, I bring up the fact that I typically, to especially at this point in my career, I, purp I purposely try to work in communities that are um, inner city, I mean, I'm a city girl, so inner city, um, a large percentage of immigrant populations, lower financially resourced, black and brown, because I want to be there and it makes a difference if we are. Now, despite my working in these communities, I am also often the only black doctor, which is, it's unfathomable to me because that is completely not representative of the community we're serving. That needs to change. And I will say that my being there the conversations, for example, I've had around the vaccinations, it has changed minds. I've had people talk to me about it saying, you know, I'm kind of hesitant about it. What do you think, Dr. Harper? Within five minutes, they're like, yeah, it makes sense to me. I'm just gonna get it done. I mean, sometimes that's all it takes. Wow. Um, the number of times I've had patients there who 
have distrusted the system. A young woman who came in having chest pain. She couldn't get in to see her doctor. She had a family history of breast cancer also. And she was like, maybe it's really breast, maybe it's breast cancer. She was very anxious. She didn't know where to go. She was terrified. We start having the discussion and I say, well, for a mammogram, you have to go to your doctor because we don't do mammograms in the ER. Before I could say anything else, she cuts me off. She feels that I'm going to like medically reject her and send her out with nothing because that's been her experience. And she says, this is why black women die. And I was heartbroken and, and I paused and I didn't get upset that she cut me off and was like making assumptions about what I was going to do. I just waited and I said to her, I am going to do an evaluation while we can't address the mammogram part, we can address the chest pain. We're gonna make sure your heart's okay. And I told her the lab work, the EKG x-ray we were gonna do, um, you know, physical exam, we could do the breast exam. And I said, we'll make sure there's no emergency today. And then for the other part, yes, you'll need to follow up. She was so comforted by that because she didn't expect that I would do anything. And she didn't expect it because people typically don't. So my being there and demonstrating something different that is appropriate changes things. Again, it shouldn't just be me. It has to be other people as well. But you know, it, it's, it's us, it's me doing my part in that way and everyone doing our part in that way that, yeah, that, that leads to trust. Tell us a little bit about your experience at the VA hospital. One of the blessings of, of being in that environment were the patients. Um, you know, and as I say in the book, I met so many heroes um, yeah. when I worked there. So many people who have given or been willing to give everything for this country, wow. literally put their lives on the line. So it was an honor to be there in service to them. They often didn't get the care that they deserved. There were positives, but there were, there were many challenges that were unnecessary um, and that didn't seem fair for the patients. And I see that inside the VA, I see it outside of the VA um, and, and it's concerning. So can you talk about where you are um, as a physician after the pandemic? It's been very difficult. I mean, uh, first being a, um, a frontline worker, there was the trauma of living through it um, and working what everyone said in the news, like working with insufficient equipment, insufficient instruction, um, just insufficient resources all around to take care of that volume and acuity of patients. And then bearing witness to all of the suffering um, and being pushed as a provider, often beyond our limits um, and expected then to give more beyond that. I mean, I would take care of people who were CT techs, x-ray techs um, in different parts of healthcare who were sick, um, who worked at other hospitals and were coming to our hospitals for care because they felt they couldn't go to their hospital because they were being forced to work sick. They knew they had coronavirus, but we also didn't have enough staffing. So their hospitals were telling them, you have to come to work anyway. It was taxing on all levels and demoralizing to feel expendable in this process. Thankfully, thankfully, at least in my region and many regions of this country, um, rates are down and certainly the, the, the severity of illness is down. But we remain working short staffed yes. because staffing has been cut yes. to, let us be honest, we'll continue to be honest, to maximize profits for the hospitals. Yeah, That's the priority in this country. So there are many providers who've had their pay cut, the, the frontline workers, the heroes we clapped for um, at dusk have had their pay cut, who've been furloughed and fired, who cannot find work. So after getting through that, now they're wondering about their livelihood. And those are the people who are lucky who are healthy because there are other people who can't work because they have um, long-term effects of COVID and then others who lost their lives. So it's been very eye-opening 
in that respect, um, again, just more reasons that the system needs to be overhauled because healthcare and wellness for patients and providers should be a right in this nation and not a privilege. So, so I, again, this is why I do this work because I, I appreciate when we have these discussions and amplify these issues because um, so much of the change that needs to happen, there's a cohort of us, you know, the, the well-meaning healthcare providers who are um, advocating for this work. And we're, the only way it's gonna happen is if it happens hand in hand with the community who demand better, who deserve better. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we grow the, the new pipeline of Dr. Harper's? How do, how do we increase the number of professional you know, health workers and people of color? It's not that there's a dearth of us, but there's a lack of access. I mean, if we're constantly navigating these, I hate the word microaggressions because the impact of them is huge. They're the huge. But like, if we're constantly navigating the structural um, inequity and violence, it's not just allowing people to live their mission because there's so much talent out there. The, the pool is enormous. It's enabling them to do it. And then once they're there, right? You know, I have these conversations with young physicians or would be physicians all the time. Once we have them there, the environment can't be so toxic that they want to leave, yes. which is often the problem as well. I have um, people that I grew up with, for example, who wanted to become doctors. They would have been amazing doctors. And then in college, they were so discouraged and they're brilliant. I went to, we went to the same school, they did well, brilliant. And then once they got to college, they were so demoralized that they got off the path. That is the story of many people. So, so we're gonna have to do this work at every step along the way. So what's next, Dr. Harper? You crush all of your goals, your absolute <laughs> black, girl, black girl magic. Just, I mean, just, there's nothing else. When, when can we expect the next bestseller? When, when is it coming? Oh my gosh, I wish I knew, but there's more. I've not crushed all, so many more goals. First of all, I'm not done with emergency medicine. There's, there's more work for me to do within the house of medicine. Um, and then there's more work for me to do outside to advance this mission. So I'm really enjoying the, the speaking I'm doing and engaging with interesting creative people in that respect. I have the seeds of the next book and it's, it's just a matter. Like I told, I, I had an interview recently for this LA Times event. And I told Heather that I just have to detonate my life to create time for the next book. So I'm in the process of figuring out how to do it and then I'll do it. I'm kind of superstitious because, you know, actually there's, there's some research on this. Don't quote me. I don't know if it's good research, but there is some research that says people who talk about their goals are less likely to do it than people who don't and just take action. So I'm a little superstitious. So while I have this idea for the next book and I'm gonna start working on it and I'm gonna detonate my life to make room, that's all I can say. All right, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't wanna do anything to prevent that next bestseller. So we, we will not speak on it. So thank you, Dr. Harper. This has been a great, great conversation. You again are absolutely black girl magic and we would just be in a better situation if we had a million of you. Um, so we need to work on that. <laughs> yes, and we do. We just need to open up the table. Like there really is room for all of us. Yes. So again, thank you to the St. Louis County Library, HEC Media, and Left Bank Books. Please go to Left Bank Books and pick up the beauty in breaking. Thank you, Dr. Harper. Thank you.